Uh, the announcements that I want to make, and this is to everybody uh, out there today, is, uh, you know, we're, we're asking the body of Christ to send in names f- uh, for pastors to pray for, and I just got to give you this little update real quick. This is a list already of what I have, and so far we have 86 pastors, not including their wives, not including the elders in their church, Tennessee, North Carolina, uh, New Jersey, New York, Texas, Arizona, Florida, Utah, California, Illinois, uh, Missouri, Massachusetts, and also prayer for uh, a leader over in Japan. So, amen. So we're, we're working on getting this set up over there, and uh, people are just really responding in a tremendous way, which tells me, you know, the body of Christ really cares about their pastors really cares about their leaders. And I'd like to see this to double, even triple. Uh, but regardless of that, it just shows people, nobody sent me any letter saying, ah, he's a wretch. Ah, you know, get him saved, drag him through the streets, get him saved or anything like that. It was just, hey, you know, uh, please pray for these pastors. Pray for the entire board. Um, pray for my pastor. He's, he's working a full-time job. And he's struggling. He's trying to come in here and teach. He's trying to hear the, the voice of the Lord. And he's just having a hard time. Others, you know, uh, their pastors are really far away from the end time understanding. They're not teaching it. They're not preparing their people. And so these uh, beautiful people are writing in saying, hey, I really want to see their eyes open and then be changed and, and become all they need to become. So I'm really excited about this. So we'll be placing these pastors' name up on the prayer wall as soon as we get that figured out. There's not enough room on the cross anymore. I know the song says there's room at the cross. Uh, <laughs> you know, and there is room at his cross. We just got to continue to staple them on there, Brother Mike. We'll figure out how to do this. But uh, I think if we did something separate, it would show our consecration towards a separate group of leaders as opposed to just those on the wall or those on the cross that need prayer. So please, if you're watching tonight, send in the pastor's names. Um, again, we're still believing for healings and deliverances according to Acts 16.31. That will never stop in this church. We'll, we'll have that cross till Jesus comes, amen? And uh, we'll be praying for those folks. So, so none of that changes uh, at all for us. So those that are uh, watching and you've sent in already. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. And we will get praying um, on those ASAP. Amen. All right. Well, happy Wednesday to everybody. Good to see you. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, God is just doing great things. He's blessing us. I'm excited about ISM. We've been on a couple years sabbatical with ISM. Those that are watching, I will have some more information online for you so you can join us. Of course, this house, you need to sign up if you want to be a part of it, but I'm looking forward to, to that teaching and getting over there and using that room for the glory of the Lord. All right, Kingdom Perspectives, the book of Acts. Has this been blessing you? Have you been learning anything? Um, been getting a good report, some folks saying, you know, they just see things in a different way and it, it really encourages them. And uh, I, I really appreciate that, and that's what this is all about. So last time we got together, here's some of the, the planks that we laid on the old gospel bridge. The under, understanding of where we are as a church is to understand where we've been. Again, that's, that's great importance. Uh, the problem with some of this is some churches want to stay in the past. In other words, they don't want to be progressive in the sense that they can't reach their community and, and have some culture understanding and societal understanding of where we are. We, we have to have that balance, okay? But the truth of the matter is the understanding of where we are as a church is to understand where we've been. We've got to have that connection. Uh, a preacher told me years and years ago when I first got saved, he said, son, always stay close to the umbilical cord. Now, I caught what he said, but as I got older in ministry and, and spent more time, you know, in in, in, in being seasoned and matured and what have you, 
I really caught that. I, I understand it more now than ever. I have to be connected to that umbilical cord. I got to stay close to it. And what is the umbilical cord? That's the source of life, the source of your teaching, the source of his presence and everything else. Whatever got you here, stay connected to it. Does that make sense? And so many times people get involved in trends and cultures, they disconnect from the past and then they lose their life source. So we don't, we don't need to do that. So it's a good balance. Our future is discovered in the past written by the one who knows the end from the beginning or the ending from the beginning. So our future is, is discovered in the past. You know, I can understand more of what God's going to do in the church by looking at the Old Testament because why? He's the same. He never changes. So if he took care of them at the Red Sea, guess what? He's going to take care of you and I at our Red Sea. If he took care of them at the battle of, of Jericho or whatever it may have been, guess what? He's going to take care of you when you have to pay that bill. Your battle may just be a bill. You may not be fighting a bunch of foreign entities. It just may be life in general. Amen? So he's going to take care of us. So the Bible's more than a book of stories. It's a guide for our, our todays and it's a compass for our tomorrows. So it's a guide for our todays and a compass for our tomorrows. That's what the word of God is. That's why we must have teaching. I love preaching. Preaching is unction. Preaching brings conviction to folks. Pre preaching brings the Holy Spirit and signs and wonders and miracles take place. But teaching brings illumination and revelation which produces motivation. Teaching produces illumination and revelation which produces motivation. It makes you want to go out and do what you've been taught because now you have the tools. Is anybody here? It's one thing to just hand you a bunch of tools. It's another thing to give you tools and instruction. And that's what teaching does. Holy Ghost teaching gives you that. How many of y'all uh, like to use YouTube on trying to figure out stuff? I'm, I probably have a master's degree or PhD in YouTube helping guide stuff. Because when I don't know something, I go right to YouTube and I just say, okay, what do I do? And somebody usually that doesn't know as much as me has the answer. Isn't that weird? It's, it's really funny how that stuff works, but they figured it out and they put it on YouTube and it's like, oh my gosh, I wish I would have known that. Okay, you women use Pinterest. I understand there's a difference between Pinterest and YouTube. And all the men said, oh well. All right, so the Bible's more than a book of stories. It is a guide for our todays and a compass for our tomorrows. Again, that's pretty basic, but uh, you'll be surprised how many people lose contact with the word of God and just go off and do their own thing. It's amazing, but they do. Acts chapter seven, verse 10 uh, was talking about the wisdom that produces favor. Wisdom produces favor. Remember wisdom, the Sophia of God. It's divine wisdom. It's the understanding from, from his position to where he sees all. Remember, God sees all, but it's filtered through his word, which is his will. God sees all, but it's filtered through his will and his word. He gets to, he sees it, but he's only going to do and tell you what to do through the character of his word, nothing else. Isn't that cool? That's why you don't need 50,000 visions and 20 prophets and all that. Read the Bible and God will speak to you. Amen? Amen. He can confirm it through other vessels, but he wants to talk to you personally. Okay, so wisdom produces fa favor. Uh, Stephen was taking them on a historical and a prophetic journey. Please remember that. This is what this teaching is about. It's historical and it's prophetic. It is uh, speaking to our future. It's also speaking to our present day. Uh, let's see, what else do we go over? Remember, Joseph was like Jesus. Again, it's a type and shadow. And so here's, here's Stephen, man. He's taking him on this historical journey. He's reaching to the past, but he's also prophesying about the present day and in the future. And, you know, these guys that were there, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadduceeical, all these people that were there, this council, you know, they were getting cut to the heart. Because truth always penetrates a callous heart. The callous heart doesn't always, re always respond in the affirmative. You ever minister to somebody and they rejected you? It doesn't matter if they rejected you. That truth went to the heart. And after time, that seed will bring life. Okay? Some plant, some water, but what? God gives the increase. Man, isn't that awesome? <laughs> that takes pressure off of me. Man, I'm just going to sow, you're going to water, and God's going to take care of it. Amen? 
So it has nothing to do with us. So Gen- uh, we talk about Genesis 41, again, talking about the dreams that uh, Joseph had. You know, again, this is type and shadow of Jesus going through the trials and tribulations. There's a match there. There's, there's some, some confirmation between the two characters historically of Joseph and the Lord Jesus. But also, you know, it shows how the father's plan was rejected. The plan of salvation was rejected. The plan of Israel was rejected by Joseph's family. And then God had to bring them through famine to get to that, to that understanding and deliverance. Same thing with the Lord Jesus. I mean, he wanted to be accepted, but they rejected him, didn't they? Verse 11, uh, this is where the spiritual br- uh, drought was taking place. We talked about that. And then what happened? Jesus came along. Jesus came as the fixer of that drought. He became the living waters. Again, with Joseph, he had the answer and he helped uh, save Pharaoh and his kingdom as well as the plan of God. Uh, We'll move on down to verse 23. And from there, we were talking about 40 years. Remember that is testing trial and probation. Jesus was tempted how many days? 40 days. So there's some examples there of that. And then verse 24 talks about the cross. And verse 28 talks about they rejected the plan. So let's get into tonight's teaching. That should just give you a little bit of refresher uh, as to where we were. All right, for tonight, the prophetic process of heaven is not bound by the time frame of man. The prophetic process of heaven is not bound by the time frame of man. God doesn't think like we think. Somebody needed to hear that. The prophetic process of heaven is not bound by the time frame of man. How many of y'all get a little frustrated when God don't show up yesterday? I'm gonna raise my hand since you won't be honest tonight. Uh, We all get a little frustrated when God doesn't come after we say amen. Amen. Uh, we get a little upset with God whenever we put that tithe check in or that offering or however we felt led to give and all of a sudden your breakthrough didn't come first day, second day, third day, third month, fourth month or what have you and we get a little upset because it should have happened when we signed the check. It doesn't work that way. So the process, the prophetic process of heaven is not bound by the time frame of man. God doesn't think like we think. And that's, that's something we're going to teach on as we go through this, these last few uh, verses here before we finish next week on chapter 7. But it's the truth, okay? He doesn't think like we think. In other words, he sees the whole picture. He sees everything else. He wants to get other people involved. He's trying to make it work his way. So we never, we never get upset about it. We should never get upset. We should do our best to walk by faith and say, okay, Father, you know best. It's not easy, is it? Thank you for being honest. Listen to this. It was 80 years between the call and commission of Moses. How long are you willing to wait on God? It was 80 years between the call and commission of Moses. How long are you, how long am I willing to wait on God? Now, I know in the natural, we don't have 80 years. Some of us can't add 80 more. (laughs) <laughs> don't look around. I'm trying not to look at anybody. I'm looking at my children. Uh, you know, we can't. We can't add any more. So I'm not using that as a... <laughs> Some of y'all just did the math. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Methuselah. Uh, yeah. Don't, so you guys are going to walk home with 80, 80 in your mind. 80 is just a number there because of the incident we're going to talk about prophetically, this event with Moses. But think about it. It was 80 years between the call and commission for Moses. Are we willing to wait on the call of God? Remember the process, the prophetic process of heaven is not on the time frame of man. Are we willing to wait for God? Now I believe we're in a season of acceleration, but again, we are a community of people who have fast food, microwave food, ATMs, Everything else that you push a button and demand a return, you put that, I wasn't going to say 50 cents, it used to be, you put that 250 in there to get one of your sugar bombs of drinks, Coca-Cola's or whatever y'all drink, 
You push, yeah, that's too, you push that button, you expect to hear ching, ching, boom, poof, and it come right out. How many of y'all had it get stuck and you had to look around and shake the machine? We saw you on video, so don't, it's, it's, it's somewhere. But it got stuck, you know, uh, it, it, it ruined your day. So the point is, we can't, we can't be in a hurry with these things. Even though it is a time of celebration, it's still not going to always be instant with God. We have to wait on him. So keep that in mind. All right. One of the most important keys to obtaining our inheritance is learning how to wait on the Lord. One of the most important keys to obtaining our inheritance is learning to wait on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord is a principle of faith because it's tied into patience. And patience and faith, they are anchors. They work together. You can't have faith without patience. And patience works with faith. It's, it's a combo. It's a dynamic duo. Sometimes uh, you all that have been around for a while, I've taught on faith and patience. And it's, it's a very powerful truth. Okay, so if we're going to attain the inheritance of God, whatever that may be for you, whatever that is for, for me, we're going to have to wait on it. We're going to have to wait on the Lord. We've got to learn that, okay? Watch this. The penalty for not waiting on the Lord is an Ishmael. The penalty for not waiting on the Lord is an Ishmael. Now, all of us have created Ishmaels in our life. All of us. Everybody here, everybody watching, we've all committed some type of an Ishmael in our life. What is an Ishmael? An Ishmael is something that you gave birth to that wasn't the will of God and you couldn't kill it. You had to send it away and let it grow. Didn't get a lot of amens, but it's the truth. I teach on that as well in ISM about the Ishmael's in our lives. We're all guilty of that. We say, we want this. We want it now. We're going to go get it. We're going to go grab it. <clears throat> Next thing you know, we got it. <laughs> and it about tears our life up. <clears throat> it about ruins us and ruins our relationship with God and people around us. And then we're like, great. When God said, if you did it my way, you could have had an Isaac. You could have had a blessing, amen. So uh, the penalty for not waiting is an Ishmael. Excuse me. All right. And then finally, the fiery trials of life enable us to hear and see clearly his plans. This is all going to make sense as we teach here. The fiery trials of life enable us to hear and see clearly his plans. There's a reason you and I go through trials and tribulations. There's reasons why we go through issues. And if we'll just be patient in the process let God have his perfect work in us. We'll come out of it better. We'll see things differently and we'll hear more clearly because we've gone through his trial, okay? And he's purged us and he's cleansed us of some things that were keeping us from fully understanding. It's not too popular of a teaching right now, but it's the truth. And if we'll just stay in the fire, we'll be processed and we'll be refined, amen? All right, Acts chapter seven. Acts chapter 7. Let's go to verse, where did I leave you last time? Verse 29. Let's see. <clears throat> All right. I left you at verse 28. Will thou kill me as thou hast killed or had did it to the Egyptian? Remember that yesterday? So it comes into verse 29. And it says, then fled Moses at this saying and was a stranger in the land of Midian. He was a stranger. He had fled. He had left that place of provision and protection because he was rejected by those around him. So Moses, here's Stephen, he's trying to, again, bring this parallel. And remember, we're talking historical and prophetic. Make sure you write that down. You have that in your mindset as we're teaching because these are parallels of Jesus as well, historically and prophetically, types and shadows. Again, Moses is a type and shadow. 
It's a type and shadow of Israel as a nation rejecting Jesus and Israel as a nation rejecting God, who God wanted to bring Jesus through the seed, to bring him through that inheritance, that legacy, the patriarchs, through that whole nation. But even in both scenarios, there was opposition. So Moses had to flee. He had to get out of there because he was not accepted by them, all right? Again, that is a parallel. And Stephen is doing such an awesome job under the unction and the expression of the Holy Spirit. I mean, this is is powerful. And I I just, one of the things that amazes me is as he's preaching, and as I told you, this is the second longest sermon as far as scriptures are concerned, And and these guys are actually letting him do this. I believe they were captivated by the Holy Spirit. I believe their mouth was held tight. I believe they had to hold their cells. I believe they were pulling the the, the cushion fibers out. I mean, everything around them, they were just bare knuckle white, white knuckles over this guy preaching. Because I don't know if I can express in teaching in modern terms the depth and the weight of this particular incident. This, this was a heavyweight battle, okay? And, and he is nailing them with such historical and prophetic truth. I'm just surprised they didn't run up on him and just rip the beard out of his face, if he had a beard, and just completely destroyed him right there mid-sentence. Well, it gets there later, but right now he is just laying this out, okay? So, so see this with me. Feel the, the impression that the Holy Spirit's trying to give us. All right, so he was a stranger in Median where he begot two sons. Now that's very important because his first son, his name was Geshem, which means a sojourner here. That's pretty powerful. And what that's telling you is he recognized and realized that he was just on a journey. His place was, was in Egypt to deliver his people but he finds himself in another area that didn't matter to him per se. It wasn't Jerusalem. It wasn't the promised land. But it was a place that he had to flee to. But in that fleeing, he gave birth through his wife. He gave, you know, he had a child. And then he named him what he felt. So that's historical proof, okay? Historical proof of what he was feeling All right, so let's go to verse 30. And when 40 years were expired, everybody say 40 years. years. Man, I mean, I know times were different and they lasted longer, they lived longer and there was longevity and all that, but that's a total of 80 years. He was 40 years old. When he rose up, he felt mature and he felt like a man. He felt like a call from God. He was going to go ahead and he was going to deliver his people. So he killed somebody. He showed himself the next, you know, days or so and said, here I am. I'm your deliverer. And they looked at him and said, you going to kill us too? And he had to flee. So 40 years later, that's why he named his son Geshem. And, and again, the name means a sojourner here, just like a visitor, a foreigner here. Just like the same thing that happened to Abraham. Remember that? It's the same spirit of covenant that is on Moses. Remember, Jesus didn't come here to stay. He was passing through. You see what I'm saying? He was passing through. He was a sojourner. We are sojourners. We don't, this is not our home. Heaven is our home. This can't be all. This can't be it, man. I, I, I don't feel very glorified in this earth suit right now. Come on now, I saw some of y'all walk in here. You don't look too glorified in your earth suit either. Uh, you know, this can't be it. This, this can't be all that we're gonna get. There's gotta be something better than this. I gotta be better looking in heaven than I, don't, Sarah laughing at me. I gotta look better in heaven than I do right now. He said we'd be glorious and last time I looked, I don't look too glorious. And neither do you, so quit it. But there's coming a day Come on, we're going to take this whole thing off, buddy, and we're going to have something that is phenomenal. It's renewed. It is supernatural. Woo, glory to God. We're never going to be sick, never going to die. Ain't going to be another funeral. The last funeral we go to is watch the devil thrown into hell, man. What a, that's going to be the funeral. 
when he's chained up and thrown there. Okay, so let me move on. So check this out. When he was 40 years old, we're, we're expired. When 40 years expired, now the word expired means full. It means to be complete. Remember I told you last week my story about Bible school. The guy said, hey man, you need to be fully baked. You're half baked. You need to stay. And he was right. Amen. There's some people that need to be fully matured. And God only will bring the inheritance, the promise, the vision, the things that he wants in your life when you are fully matured. There are things in your life and my life that we want that God hasn't given us yet because we're not mature to receive it. That's just good fatherly teaching right there. And we don't have people that teach us because we have our faith teachers that say, wambo, bambo, boom, you got it. It doesn't always work that way. Hippity, hippity, doppity, whatever. And they pull a rabbit out of the hat and all this stupid stuff and hyper faith and, and hyper stuff and people get all excited and they run around and I got it, I got it, I'm claiming, I'm claiming, I'm taking it back from the devil, woo. And they as broke as they were the day, the day they came in the service. In fact, they're broker because they gave all kinds of money and nothing happened. Why? Because some things you ain't mature to receive yet. I love my children. I would love for them to drive me around. There's just some days I'd like to see Judah get in the, in the truck and drive me to town. But how many of y'all know he's 11 years old and he ain't mature enough to drive that truck? In his mind, he can. If he gets his little controller in his hand and he's playing a video game or something like that, yeah, sure, he can do it, but he crashes at 150 miles an hour and it says restart. <laughs> and all the pieces come back together and he, you know what I'm talking about. We don't get replay in life. So no matter the age, you know, you have to be a certain age in order to receive certain blessings and responsibilities and inheritance. And that's one of the problems we have in the church today is because we have, a preacher, we have preachers and teachers who tell everybody, oh man, you know, you're ready for God's blessings. Well, that's not always true. We're all in different seasons of our life. Now, is it true God wants to bless everybody? Absolutely. Across the board, absolutely. He's not a respecter of persons, but he is a respecter of favor and he's a respecter of maturity. Boy, that didn't hit too good for anybody, but it's the truth. It's the truth for me as well. There are many things I said, God, why not now? Why not me? I'm faithful. I, I think I just should have it. I should have my opportunity. You know, other people have, have abused it. Every, other people have burned out and burned up and failed and tripped and fumbled. Why not me? Well, guess what? I'm, I'm not the author and the finisher of my faith. He is. I'm just the clay. I'm just the vessel. I can only do what he allows me and affords me and empowers me to do, all right? So that's good teaching and, and, and we have to have that balance, all right? So this is what it is. 40 years were expired. There appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. Notice this, Moses had his call at 40, he knew it was time to raise up. He knew at that time of fullness of maturity, I'm supposed to deliver my brethren. But it was another 40 years before he got the commission. This is the commission of God to Moses. Remember, your commission from God will always be in the fire. Your commission, your ordination, your sending out will always be in the fire. How do we know that? Because it was on the day of Pentecost. Jesus said, Terry, you hear. Then when? Then what? When? On the day of Pentecost, what? You'll be empowered with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And so many people, again, out of lack of maturity, they run out and there's no fire. So in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, an angel of the Lord and a flame of fire in a bush. So we have 80 years. This is double trials, double testing, double probation. Listen, let me just say this to somebody listening to me tonight, wherever you may be with your walk with God right now. Some of us have to go through double trouble and double pain and double testing to receive a double blessing from God. Some of us are destined for greatness in different levels than other people, and that's fine, and that's the way that is. Not everybody's going to be in the same. Not everybody's going to be the same level. They're not even the same rewards in heaven. 
The callings and the giftings of God are different. There are greater judgments for preachers and teachers and so on and so forth. But God has a call for everybody. God calls everybody. We just have different callings. But some of us have to go through trials. And if you're listening tonight and you've been going through hell, you've been going through terrible times, guess what? It's because God's gonna bring you to that place of double. He's got a greater work for you to do. He's got a greater work for you to do. So you gotta carry a, a bigger load. Come on now. Listen, when you look at ath- athletics, for example, I'll just use football for, for one example. A linebacker and the guy who's a tackle or, t- or who plays on the front line of the team, he works out and he lives a lot different than the punter. The punter can get away eating bonbons and cotton candy. The others have to eat differently. They have to train differently. They have to put greater pressure and greater weights and restraints on their lives. Why? They have a bigger call. They have a bigger duty. All are important, but there's a different call. So here it is. Moses, he's in this place. He's in this wilderness place. Now, the angel of the Lord is really called the angel of the covenant. I want you to write that down. Angel of the covenant. angel of the covenant, it's really speaking of the Lord Jesus, okay? It's an angel, the angel of the covenant. This is not a created angel. There is a difference, okay? Because only God can give you the commission. Only God can bring you into that position of where you're, you're, you're called and you're commissioned to go out and do what he wants you to do. Okay, all right. So this angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame, in a bush. Now I want you to write down this type of bush because it's really gonna, it's, it, it matters, okay, to give you more explanation. It's a bramble bush, B-R-U-M-B-L-E, B-R-U-M-B-L-B, B-L-E, excuse me, B-L-E. I wish I could put my writing board up here, but because of the camera, they can't see it and it's just not, not fair for them. But I'll be using that board over an ISM, okay? So that I'll, I'll be able to teach more of Greek and Hebrew. All right, a bramble bush. Why does that matter? Because a bramble bush was a thorn bush. It was a thorn bush. Okay, what's the significance of that? Because Jesus wore a crown of thorns and he is that fire, the fiery presence of God, the all-consuming love of God. See the, see the symbolic, the historical and the prophetic analogies and, and the tie-ins, it's unmistakable how that God was showing his plan for Israel through Moses and through the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? So 80 years, here he is, he's sojourning, he's a visitor, he's a foreigner. This isn't his promise necessarily. But the process of heaven, the prophetic process isn't the time frame of man. I mean, you think about it, what was going on in Moses' mind for 40 years of exile? He was rejected. He killed a man. He knew that if he went back to Pharaoh, no matter how fair he was, no matter how much favor he had, Pharaoh would have had to have put him to death. He would have had to have because of law. So he loses everything the sin for a season, everything that he had, all the riches. I mean, you know, if you put it in modern day terms, I mean, he was the Prince of Bel Air. I mean, he was, he had it all. He, you know, nothing, nothing Moses couldn't have. He was born into all of the riches and he gave it all up. And then for another 40 years, he's in the desert. He's in a place that's not his home necessarily. And then all of a sudden on the perfect day in the fullness of time, God shows up in a burning bush. (laughs) I love that, man. And here he is looking at this thing. It didn't consume it. It was a complete miracle that it didn't burn it up. 
Amen? Verse 23 had his call, but in this verse here, in verse 30, he had his commission. Verse 31, when Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. Me too. Wouldn't you? He wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him. That would have been it for me right there. I mean, it'd be one thing to see it burning and then it start talking to me. I know you guys are all spiritual. You say, yes, Lord, what thou saith unto me is, I doeth knoweth. Well, I'm goeth. I'd have been like, what that you say? As I was trucking, leaving some of my garments behind. <laughs> I'd have, I would have been gone. I would have been the burning bush. I would have been flame of fire. I would have been out of there. Wouldn't you? But Moses, he checked it out. I, know, I didn't put it in there, but there, there should be like another verse that says, and after Moses got off the ground and his defibrillator went off and the medics cleared him, but no, it came unto him saying, I am God of the fathers, of your fathers. What? The God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not uh, behold. No, he didn't even look at it. So we, there's his fear right there. So here it is, burning bush. He's about to have his commission. The father comes to him through that burning bush, the Lord Jesus speaks to him and says again, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, or Isaac and the God of Jacob. Then Moses, he trembled. There he is right there. He trembled. I imagine his knees played the best congos. Because uh, I don't know, I've been in some, some pretty intense moments with the Lord and, and there's been some times where this presence has been so heavy and so awesome that it does make you think, oh my gosh, you know, this may be it. <laughs> this may be the last moment because he's real heavy on me right now. How many all ever been there? But notice that a, fi a voice came out of the fiery thorns. Again, here's the per prophetic significance for you and I. It's in your fiery trials, you're gonna hear the voice of the Lord. It's in your deepest trials. It's when you're in the most thorny place, when things don't feel right, when things are sticking and pricking you and bothering you and cutting you and you just think, oh my gosh, I mean, how much more can I take of this? That's when the Lord's gonna speak to you. Isn't that awesome? Somebody said, I wish he'd hurry up. But you gotta go through your process. Everybody has a different process and the timing of it. Verse 33, then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thy stand is holy ground. Okay, so let's look at this. Moses was rejected. He became a sojourner. He was in a foreign land. I want you to write down Exodus 2, chapter 22. Exodus 2, chapter 22. And that will, that, that will talk to you about his journey there. Okay? Yeah. Exodus chapter 2, verse 22. Yes, ma'am. He said, take off, take off your shoes there. This is holy ground. Now, let, let's, go, let's go a little more into perspective of what Stephen is saying. Check this out. This is really cool. So Stephen is talking about Moses. It almost seems lethargic. It almost seems like an elementary Sunday school type of uh, course that he's given them, but he's not. He is, he is digging at them prophetically. He's digging at them emotionally. He's digging at them morally. He's digging at them according to covenant, traditions, and customs. I mean, he is shredding their, their veneer, their shield, everything that they had as a religious garb, both physically and spiritually, I mean, was being shredded right before their very eyes. Because what he's showing them is this, that Moses went to Midian, he went to a place that wasn't Israel, it wasn't Jerusalem, it was none of those things because it had yet to be uh, completely established in those things. So he was on a journey like Father Abraham was. This is why he spoke to him, said, I am the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and who? Jacob. So he's, he's speaking to him of the authenticity of who he is, but he's also telling him that I am the God that keeps covenant. 
So here's Stephen telling these guys, this God that kept covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the same God that kept covenant with Moses and all of Israel and did the same through Jesus right before your very eyes, right at this time of your life, and you didn't even see it. I mean, you ever been slapped before? I mean, this was a slap and then a re-slap. You know, front slap and then the back slap. I mean, this was the slap of all slaps when it came to religion and, and history and teaching and trying to bring about truth uh, to these guys. It was an amazing, amazing sermon that Stephen did. I believe we're gonna see more preaching like this in the coming days. I believe we're gonna see preachers stand up on live television and just lay out powerful, powerful truth, not how you can get blessed and be like me, stunning Steve and whatever. I mean, they're just gonna preach to the core and they're gonna try to hit the delete button and, and get off live television and it ain't gonna stop them. They're gonna preach, just watch. You say, well, I don't believe that. Well, the two witnesses will preach to the whole world. Wonder how that's gonna be done. It's gonna be done through television. It's gonna be done through satellite, cable, YouTube and what have you. Man, you talk about live stream from heaven. Woo, I'm looking forward to that day. And one of you all will be right there doing it too. I believe that. So, so check this out. He told him he was, he was the God of his fathers. Verse 33, again, watch it. Then he said, uh, the Lord said to him, put off thy shoes from thy feet for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Well, wait a minute. This isn't Jerusalem. Think with me for a second. This isn't, this isn't even near there. How is this holy ground? It's holy ground because it's the presence of the Lord. Wherever the Lord is, there's holiness. And he promised Israel that wherever you go, I will be there. So there was never meant to be one specific tabernacle. There was never meant to be one specific temple. There was never meant to be one specific city and the only city. It was supposed to be mobile because God is universal. God is all over the place. God is nationwide. God is everything, everywhere. I mean, everywhere as far as who he is, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient. He is who he said he is according to the word of God. And he was showing, this is why Stephen brought this out. It wasn't filler. You say, what is filler? Filler is what they teach you in preaching school so there's not a bunch of silence going on when you're preaching. It's called filler. Amen, hallelujah, praise God. Amen, hallelujah, praise God. You ever heard that before? Amen, hallelujah. That's just to keep people entertained and keep the, the show going. That's not what this is. He was telling them, hey guys, the promises that God made to Moses were not just one specific place, it was global. You guys have the corner market on Israel, the corner market on Jerusalem. You have the corner market on religion. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus came to break your corner market, that he came for all men. Guess what? Here's another thing you need to see. This is really cool. Not only was it not Jerusalem, it was literally Gentile property. It was, it was Gentile property. So he was proven to them, I'm the God of the Gentiles way back then. You see, we get messed up. We say, oh, the, the finally the church, the, you know, the Christians or the Gentiles, they were engrafted into the vine. Yes, that speaks of that in the New Testament, but we are engrafted in God's heart from the beginning. Just like Jesus was plan A and never plan B, we were never plan B. We were always plan A. Though he used Israel and the Jews to be the, be the vessel and the birth canal, if you will, of the Messiah, we were already in the mind of God. Glory to God, hallelujah. So that's why you can't go around and say, well, I'm a second class citizen. And then there's people who, you know, they use their Jewish roots to supersede you and say, well, you know, my last name is Ben Bar Jonah, whatever. And oh, well, great. I'm glad for that. I, I like Mace, you know, the, the Messiah, uh, you know, those roots and all that stuff, the, the, the Messianic roots and whatever, whatever they have in there. I'm with all that, you know, carrying the flags and dancing. What, that's fine. But that doesn't make you any better than me because it's all the same blood. And just to prove it, God says, guess what? I've engrafted you into the vine. Engrafted to the point that there's no sign that it was ever engrafted. Amen. Anyway, that's a whole nother teaching. But people get really super freaked out and they say, well, you know, uh, I can't be as good as this person because I don't have that bloodline. What are you talking about? I have the bloodline. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm inherit, I have the inheritance. 
I'm adopted. Amen. So anyways, the blessings are for all of us. So this is what he was trying to show them. He was trying to bring this to their understanding. Okay? Uh, Psalms 118.12. You don't have to go there, but write that down. Psalms 118.22. Uh, I said 12. I meant 22. Can y'all give me about five more minutes so I don't rush? Psalms 118, verse 22. Just let me get that for you real quick. You can look at about, this is the stone which the builders rejected or refused to be, has become the head of the corner. Remember that? We remember that that's been used so many times. Powerful truth. Okay. That goes into verse 34. And I have seen, and I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I've heard their groaning and am come down to deliver them. And now I come and I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, when they refuse saying, now watch this, this Moses, whom they refused saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge, the same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. His commission came, but notice that it's the same verse, same understanding of the cornerstone that was rejected. Psalms 118.22. See the parallel between Moses and Jesus? They rejected Moses. They rejected Jesus. Moses became the deliverer. Jesus became the deliverer. Stephen is telling them, look, I'm showing you historically. I'm trying to show you guys prophetically. This was the plan of God all along. Just like Moses, it's the same with Jesus and you guys can't see this. You've rejected him, but God hasn't rejected him. He made him the chief cornerstone upon which the entire kingdom rests upon. Do you see how powerful the sermon was with Stephen? how he was laying it out there. Now watch verse 35. I told you that this Moses, they refused. Let's go to verse 36. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and of the Red Sea and the wilderness 40 years. Again, proving to them that God was with them, took them through those trials. And this that Moses, this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto all your brethren like unto me, him shall you hear. Who was he talking about? That's right. He was talking about the Lord Jesus. He was prophesied about Jesus way back then. This is, this is amazing. This is amazing. All the way back then, he's prophesying that Jesus would come. And even still, these guys could not see it. They could not recognize, they could not realize that this was the Lord Jesus Christ. And they wouldn't accept it. Now watch this. Verse 39. To whom our fathers would not obey, here it is, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt, saying unto Aaron, make us gods to go before us. For, for as this, for this Moses, which uh, brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. We don't know what's become of him. So they rejected Moses. They rejected his call. They rejected the plan of God. And they turned to the gods of the Canaanites. Watch verse 41. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and, re and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up. That's powerful. God turned and he gave them up to worship the host of heaven as is written in the book of the prophets, O your house of Israel, you have offered to me uh, to, to slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness. He said, you, you didn't offer me anything. You didn't give me what I wanted. You gave me 
what you wanted, and that was to worship your own way. Yea, you have took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Rephim, which that was a Canaanite god. It actually tied into Saturn, by the way. Figures which you made to worship, to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. So I'm gonna stop right there. So let me, let me tie this all together. So verse 38 talks about the, the church in the wilderness. Remember I talked about that in the past. They were in the church of the wilderness. Again, trying to get these guys, these council to see that the church of God is universal. It has always been. It's always existed. Jesus just came to be the chief cornerstone. He just came to be the head of it all and to establish it in New Testament terms under the blood, under better blood. But it was already established through covenant in Old Testament times according to the will of God. But again, they refused to see this and they rejected it. And what's amazing about this, and here's this, this is the last final thought. These guys that were bringing Stephen and the apostles up for persecution and trial, they were protecting the business and the worship of Moses to whom their fathers dishonored, but yet they dishonor Christ by trying to worship Moses and the law. Do you see that? And that's what people do today when they use the law, when they use religion and they use their own form and fashion of Christianity and say, well, you know, this is how I'm gonna worship God. This is how I'm gonna live. This is how I'm gonna do what I wanna do. When in actuality, you've made an idol of those things and you put it before God. And man, I'm telling you, Stephen is laying it out from a, pe- a preacher's point of view. This is an amazing, amazing truth that he's laying out there and there's a lot of stuff in there for you and I for today so I hope that's blessed you go over that some more and read it and uh, hopefully by next Wednesday I can at least finish chapter seven can't promise but it's getting better and better amen father we love you thank you so much for all you do thank you for just bringing us into all truth I know it's hard to hear about the process of time and and waiting on the inheritance and maturity and all these things, but, but I know that you're faithful to us and, and when you're ready and you know we're ready, Father, we're gonna receive many things in these last days so that we can finish this job of bringing in a final harvest for you. Thank you so much for this truth. We love you and we look forward to Sunday morning in Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys, appreciate you, see you Sunday. Amen.